So my father was very instinctive. He would literally walk into a room and know immediately what to do with it. And very often it had almost nothing to do with the room. He was always looking for freshness and newness and something new, especially in his work for clients. And so because he, he was always very keen to, to make every room look different to every other room he'd ever done. I think my father was sort of driven by a kind of aesthetic sensibility and a desire for beauty and order. He liked things to be very stylish. He liked things to be very carefully arranged, formal arrangements of things. He liked a lot of graphic simplicity. He spent a couple of years in the army doing his national service, which everyone at the time had to do. But it, I think it had quite a strong effect on him in a way. And I have all his letters. His letters, when he first arrived in the army, his handwriting is really quite messy, normal sort of, you know, he was 18, I suppose, sort of 18 year old young man's writing, like normal handwriting. Within two years, by the time he leaves the army, it's the most stylized handwriting you can imagine. It's extremely legible, well communicated, sort of aesthetic sensibility. And his time in the army, he happened to be almost constantly based in great country houses. He was in the Royal Army Education Corps, and so he was teaching art, teaching painting, teaching the history of art to sort of squaddies, to ordinary soldiers. And so it's a combination of all of that. His approach to rooms was to try to get a, a very graphic simplicity in the end. So he wanted a, an easily understood image so he had a particular way of working with colour. Colour was enormously important to him. And where most clients, all they really want is off-white and beige and very neutral. He would do that very occasionally. He'd quite often do that for himself. But he absolutely loved to do strong coloured rooms. And he would do these rooms that were saturated with one colour. He always used a lot of white. And white was a good way of framing his rooms. And so he would have white ceilings always. He thought colored ceilings were absolute anathema. And then very often just white woodwork, white frames on things. He quite liked to have a white dado, you know, the lower part of the wall painted white. So that the color was really concentrated and framed by all this white. But he did do this thing with color where he would layer on saturated sort of palettes of one color, so there'd be pinks and reds and oranges all together. Very often, there'd just be one color. And it does give a very strong look to his rooms. It also gives a strong personality to them. So the amazing thing really about my father is that his influence continues to be almost as strong today, I think 25 years after he died, as it's ever been. You know, the reason for that really, it's partly because his work is so easy to understand in a way. It has such a strong graphic sort of look to it that people can very easily say, oh, well, that's David Hicks. It's also partly because it is actually quite richly varied. There's something for everyone. And he's using antiques, he's using modern furniture, he's combining different periods. There's no defining thing that excludes other styles in a way. And so everybody looks at it and says, oh, well, I love, you know, David Hicks is just, that, that's me, I love that, and he's such an inspiration. The other reason for it, of course, is that he very candidly produced all these books. He published so many books of his work at a time when almost no decorator was producing books. And so he really, really pushed out there this portfolio of work and this ongoing sort of array of work of all different kinds private houses, historic houses, modern houses, there are offices, there are restaurants, there are shops. And then he had a whole new career as a garden designer, and he's a huge influence on a whole number of very eminent garden designers today. We're very, very different people. But I am, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm a rather happier person. He was not a happy person. And he always, you know, I've recently been rereading all of his letters and his diaries and things and he's always terribly frustrated and 
always dreaming of some sort of global empire of David Hicks sort of across the planet. Every time he gets on an aeroplane, you know, it's in the days of in-flight magazines with the map, the route map. And every single time he tears out the route map and he's drawing on it where he's working, where his offices are, where he's going. And it's this sort of megalomaniac, sort of, he's like Napoleon up in an aeroplane, you know, planning world domination through fabrics and wallpaper. His entire working life, he never earned a penny. His business made a little bit of money, but it, all he got was his expenses paid. And towards the end of his life, he's constantly trying to tell people, you know, of course, I've never earned a penny from my work. And they never believed him because they assumed he'd become so famous as a designer. It seemed completely unbelievable that he hadn't actually earned money from it. But he literally was never paid a penny for his work, which is madness. <laughs>